Support for Connect the Bay and its community outreach initiative has been provided by the North Bay Leadership Council. Welcome to Connect the Bay. We're calling this edition Bay Area 2020. What the new year means for equity, tech, the environment, and our future. I'm Adia White. And I'm Steve Mencher. We talked with people throughout the Bay Area for this program. Coming up, we'll hear from a geographer who's written perhaps the definitive book on the gulf separating rich and poor in our tech-obsessed region, a tribal chairman who will talk about the changes his tribe is financing with dollars from its casino, and how we might take lessons from the first people to live in the Bay Area. And we'll hear from an educator and researcher who's connecting equity in the environment. She'll be joined by students who are working us to make us realize that climate change is an emergency that must be addressed now. But first, I visited with John Powell, a leader in finding new ways to understand and talk about racism. Powell teaches law, ethnic studies, and African American studies at the UC Berkeley School of Law. I start out by asking him how he defines othering and how he sees it playing out in 2020. So othering basically is when you deny someone their full humanity and at the extreme you see someone who's apparently other because they're really probably it's not another but we think of other people, people as other and sometimes we also think of them as a threat and that they don't belong and so it can be based on their race, their gender preference, their religion, their immigration status and then bad things happen both to the target but also to the overall society. And we oftentimes say that the intervention for othering is not saming, uh, but belonging. Uh, and so how do we actually fully embrace uh, that people belong? And we think of belonging as different than inclusion. Um, inclusion is more you're joining something that's already there. So whether it's a school or a workplace or a church, it's there and you join. And if, you, if there's accommodation, usually it's upon the joiner to a, accommodate him or herself to the norms and institution that's already there. Belonging suggests that we co-create the thing we belong to. It's not just there. We participate in giving the shape. And in order to co-create, we need at least three things. We need agency. Uh, we need um, power. Uh, and we need uh, love or compassion. And when we co-create belonging, it's not just for ourselves or our group. It's actually for all groups and for the institution itself. So it's a, a more robust involvement um, than inclusion. And in our everyday lives, how do you think that we can be making sure that we're creating a world where people can belong rather than just trying to include people? Well, I think two things. I think part of it is really um, listening to people, being engaged in what we call empathetic or compassionate listening, uh, dialogue, in practice. Uh, and sometimes it just happens naturally, more or less in a family, but sometimes we have to work at it. And so the things we can do, so um, I can listen to someone else's story and really not just interpret it to my story, which is same again. It's like, oh, I, I know that it's just like this happened to me, but really listen and not listen in terms of arguing, not listen in terms of, you know, that, that person made a mistake, I'm going to get them as soon as they shut up, uh, but really just. Uh, listen to their full expression of their humanity. There's a South African word called sabawanu, which means I see you. Or it's also interpreted as the God in me sees the God in you. So to fully see someone, um, listen to their story, the stories or, or narratives we live in matter. And those are oftentimes promulgated by our leaders and by our, our institutions themselves. So what's the story about being an American? Um, and while all of us participate in that, our leaders have an oversized role. So leaders can tell stories that help bring people together, um, that help people see each other. Um, think about John F. Kennedy's thing of, uh, uh, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. He was actually asking people to step outside themselves and to be something larger than themselves. 
unfortunately, I think we've slipped into a space now where it's like it's all about me and my apparent group. And I see, and frankly, it's coming from um, you know, White House, Congress. Uh, it's like everyone who's not me is a threat to me. And so that's an expression of what we call othering or breaking as opposed to belonging and bridging. And in your recent book, Racing to Justice, you talk a lot about how this plays out in terms of policy. Can you talk a little bit more about how you see colorblind as being an issue in terms of writing policies that really target inequity in general? In more recent terms, we've used the colorblind has been appropriated to say we're all the same. And even though uh, you know, blacks are much more likely to die at birth, uh, much more likely to go to schools without adequate resources, are still not in positions of power and authority in the same way the whites are, have about one-tenth the wealth the whites have. Uh, people say, we're not, we're not going to look at any of that. And that oftentimes people think of race, and it's not all negative. People think of, okay, so we've used race in this country to both, both form the country, if you think about slavery, but we've always also used it to create this caste system. So couldn't we stop thinking about race? Is that the solution? And the answer is no. It's like saying, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to think about my illness. It doesn't go away because you don't think about it. It's already in our system. It's in our structures. And it's in our behavior. It's in our culture. And the other thing we know is that not only is it in our structures, right, it's also um, in our unconscious. The conscious is actually fairly small. The unconscious is very big and very vast. Uh, and it doesn't respond to um, our conscious demands. And just give you one last example. My dad, who just recently passed, I'm six of nine. Um, so we had a house that my dad and mom bought in the 1950s. They paid $11,000 for it in Detroit. And he sold that house for $5,000. That's the house where nine children were raised. It had like five bedrooms, three bathrooms. If the house had been in the suburbs, be worth $400,000. Uh, that's racism. Um, but it's not that anyone necessarily uh, is thinking evil of my dad or thinking evil of me, but the structure of how race operates in our society is very much alive. And then with the uh, reinsertion of breaking and othering from the highest halls of justice, uh, we're seeing even a return to the old kind of intentional racism as well. Do you have any policies in mind here in the Bay Area that you feel like we really need to address in order to promote equality? Well, it's interesting. Um, let me say a couple of things. Mm -hmm. I would equality is a complicated concept. Okay. Uh, and it's, it, the way we use it in this country is too thin. Mm -hmm. So equality in the West comes from Aristotle. Aristotle knew that there were two kinds of equality. He talked about geometric and arithmetic. And uh, arithmetic equality is where you treat everybody the same. Uh, geometric uh, equality from Aristotle was that you treat people different, who are situated differently, differently. I often tell the story of when I was at The Ohio State University and they had a rule that if you were going to rent a car, even if you paid for it out of your own pocket, you had to rent a subcompact. Well, I'm 6'4", and I said, I'm not doing that. And they said, we treat everybody the same. But it doesn't make sense to treat everybody the same. So that's why I say equality is a, a complicated concept. So I think we don't really want equality in the thin sense. We want equality in the thick sense or something called equity or fairness. How do we treat everybody fair? How do we actually invest in people? Uh, and we have to do it differently. Different people need different things. Right. If you could have three resolutions for the Bay Area in 2020, what would some of them be? I would say the first one would be to really um, think about a public infrastructure being housing and transportation and trying to make it really accessible for everyone. I mean, as you know, the Bay Area is crazy expensive. More and more people are being pushed out or pushed to the margin. Um, and, and so the public infrastructure is not serving the public anymore. Uh, and it's not only not serving uh, people who are without, without houses or homeless, it's not serving people who are middle class, working class. Uh, it's, it's, and um, if that continues, it will have a negative effect on the Bay Area, on the life here. Uh, so I would really sort of think about how do we make the public infrastructure really for the public and invest in that in a very serious way. Uh, I would also uh, open up 
forums where people could come. They, they do a thing in, in uh, Europe now where they have, uh, I think it's in Manchester, where they actually invite people to public forums just to talk and meet each other. Um, and they have one of the things called like talking benches. And if you sit on this bench, it means you're open to a conversation with anyone else to sit on the bench. Um, and what they're trying to address is the fragmentation and that we don't know, know each other anymore. Um, and so I think we have to be, uh, we can curate physical space so that people come together, but we also can curate those, some of those conversations. Uh, in the United States, you know, I've actually started talking to some restaurant owners about having tables where people could come and say, you sit at this table, I'm willing to talk with whoever else sits at the table. We probably can't do public benches right now because the public in the United States has become so toxic. Um, and, and part of that is racialized. Public was good when it was basically all white. As people of color and, uh, and other people start coming into public space, one of the strategies was to remove support for the public and leave it to people who, um, and, and if you think about public schools, right? We sort of, we stopped investing in public schools. Uh, part of the thing that came out of um, Brown v. Board of Education was that in the South, we, they created all these private schools, which weren't really private, but it was a way for whites to escape. So I think we have to really invest in the public, have public infrastructure, but I also think we have to have a, um, a shared set of stories. How do we actually learn about each other? How do we actually um, talk to each other? Uh, and some, some projects about that, So, which is both about our history, but equally important about our collective future. Um, uh, and, and bringing those resources to bear. So those are three things that I would weigh on. Thank you so much again. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Thanks, Adia, that was a great interview. I really learned a lot. Thank you. Now there's a, a, an argument to be made that 2020 is gonna be the most momentous year in either of our lives. There's the ongoing impeachment uh, leading up to the 2020 elections. There's the climate change emergency, the women's rights anniversary. When you went out onto the street, what did you find that was top of mind for the people that you talked to out there? Well, people certainly mentioned all of those issues, but really what every single person or nearly every single person we spoke to had to say is that they wanted to see something be done about homelessness. Um, so we head to next San Jose and downtown um, Oakland to hear what they had to say directly. Do you have any New Year's resolutions for the Bay Area? I want to see a comprehensive uh, plan to end homelessness. And I think part of that is clamping down on developers and uh, making sure that people have living wages that, you know, I think those are the key ingredients that will keep pushing people out. To see more equitable affording ho affordable housing. I'm a teacher in a in the Allen Rock School District and I have a lot of families that come through the area that um, feel very restricted with what they can afford. Uh, a lot of families that are moving out to Modesto or other parts of California. I think we need to help the homeless. We need to do some things, make uh, progress in that area. We are very positive about Oakland, but we uh, feel that the problem of the homelessness is the, it's the biggest problem right here in Oakland. An increase in support for our homeless um, it stands out every time we come out to Oakland. I used to live out here, and now we just kind of visit here and there, but um, it just seems to be greater and greater every time we come out this way. And you know, we have such huge housing crisis and homelessness crisis, and uh, I really wish that we could all take a, take a step forward just to um, do something about it. Por supuesto, mm -hmm. que la renta baje. Y pienso que va subiendo y va subiendo más. Y mucha gente está viviendo en la calle y no queremos eso. Homelessness is, is problematic. Um, there have been some interesting solutions sort of proposed uh, where uh, Rebecca Kaplan's been talking about bringing in cruise liners and trying to, to find ways to work that in. I think there's some really interesting opportunities in using the container ships um, that could potentially be used as modular housing. I see many people, you know, walk by what is obvious, like the homeless and uh, uh, people suffering from drug addiction and they are looking at it as if it's normal. Like we see ducks on a lake, we should see homeless people on sidewalks and that's disturbing. I'd really like to actually focus on um, helping the homeless 
before uh, starting more technology and pushing out the families. Now, because of what we're hearing from the community, I'd like to start my conversation with Richard A. Walker by talking about homelessness. He's Professor Emeritus of Geography at the University of California, Berkeley. And his recent book about the Bay Area is Pictures of a Gone City. Welcome to Connect the Bay. Thanks very much, Stephen. Well, if we're going to be talking about homelessness, let's start with what happened last week. There was a group called Moms for Housing. They had occupied a home in West Oakland. And after they had occupied that home, they had been evicted from the home, forced out. And then the governor got involved, the mayor got involved, a, a land trust got involved, and now it looks like they're going to be able to move back into that home. Well, that's great, but it's not the way you should have a housing market work. It's, the housing market isn't working for people like that. The bottom 25% or so really have no access to housing in the Bay Area. Most of the housing in the Bay Area is priced for the top 25%. And in between, you have massive displacement of people who are uh, packing in together, crowding, or they're moving very far out uh, and commuting an hour, two hours each way, which is crazy. So housing has many sources. Homelessness has many sources. But uh, housing is really the fundament. And we used to have public housing. No advanced country, just like no advanced country except ours, doesn't have a universal health care system. No advanced country except ours doesn't have a massive public housing uh, policy for the bottom 20, 25 percent. Now, when we're talking about housing in the Bay Area, we obviously have to talk about the tech boom, and we'll talk more about that in, in our conversation. But over the past year, uh, 2019 was the year that Facebook and Google and Apple especially said, well, we're going to throw billions of dollars into the housing market, and we think we can make a difference in the housing market, especially for affordable housing. What's your point of view on that? Well, it's a drop in the bucket. The housing market is much, much bigger than that. And they can throw some billions, that's fine. That's good that they finally recognize their role in this. Because clearly, the tech boom has been the driving force behind this extraordinary growth of the Bay Area. And that growth has just put too much pressure on housing. There's actually no way you can build enough housing or bring in enough cruise ships or whatever it might be, or modular, to deal with the homeless problem or with housing in general. So that's going to take much longer. But in the short run, the tech boom and inequality are the greatest uh, problems for housing, the greatest sources of the housing crisis in the Bay Area today. I liked uh, what Professor Powell had to say about you know, inequality and inequity. And you know, in your book is, is full of examples that the top 1%, the bottom 50%, there's such a gulf between them, and it's getting worse and worse. And 2020 isn't going to be much better, is it? That's right. I mean, the Bay Area, we like to be, we pride ourselves in being very liberal, egalitarian, and so on. But inequality here is as bad as anywhere. Even though we have the highest average wage in the world for any big city, any big region, there are still a quarter of the population, the working people, who are at minimum wage. And there's half of the people who are struggling because they don't participate in those riches of the tech bubble. So the tech companies, you have to remember the Bay Area, of course, is the world center of tech, which is very important. The tech companies have been enormously successful. But in addition, they get huge monopoly profits because they control the basic means of communication today. And then on top of that, money just flows in uh, because there's a lot of loose money around the world that has nowhere to go. And it goes into tech stocks, among other things. And that's why the tech co corporations are com at the top of the corporate uh, capitalization rankings for the world. And that's weird. That is not right. There's something strange going on that puts too much money into the Bay Area. And most of that money sticks at the top and leaves too many of the people behind. All right. Now, there was something you said recently I heard on, on YouTube. I heard you say that the Bay Area is the most important place in the world right now. And, and you're saying a little bit of why that's possible and why that's true. 
and the shooting star of contemporary capitalism. But when I hear you talk about shooting stars, it seems to me that shooting stars eventually burn out. And I wonder if 2020 is the year that the Bay Area might possibly come down to earth. Well, it's possible. We've had the greatest decade of any place in the world in the 2010s. We've had a good run for a long time, since the gold rush, really. But the decade of the 2010s, you know, we think of, oh, China, Shanghai, uh, London, New York, Wall Street. But the Bay Area, no place, has been more successful. We're, our GDP of the Bay Area grew by about two-thirds in this decade. And that just puts enormous pressure on everything. Uh, it's just, we're just exploding from that, that kind of bomb of tech success. I know Gavin Newsom and others like to say that California as a whole is about the sixth largest economy in the world if it was put up against other world economies. Is, is that still true? Yeah, yeah, it's probably fifth. Ah, okay. We passed France uh, <laughs> about three, four years ago. Oh my gosh, now what are the ramifications of that? Well, uh, look, growth is a bit out of hand. The ramifications are rising density, building everywhere, uh, and this massive displacement of people. The city is being churned in an extraordinary way in this decade, and people f realize it. They feel that kind of pressure, and a lot of them have been forced out. They've moved to Oregon. They've moved to Indiana. They've moved to Nevada. They moved out to the Central Valley and commute back in. So our houses, our housing, our neighborhoods have been massively uh, upset, re reshuffled. And the winners in this are really the top 25, 20, 25% uh, who are packing into San Francisco, into Silicon Valley, into the Central East Bay. And an awful lot of people can't live where they've lived for generations. All right, now just a final question about tech. Uh, Justice John Roberts, Chief Justice John Roberts, who's a little busy these days in, in Washington, D.C., but he did recently say that social media can threaten our democracy. Now, is that something that, that rings true to you? Well, it, it's extraordinary that Justice Roberts would say anything that radical. But it's absolutely right. Social media is the infrastructure of our communications today. It is the railroads or the AT&T, the telegraph of the 19th century, the telephones of the 20th century. It's extraordinary how it has permeated everything. So given that foundation, we need, as a society, we have to think very seriously about how it's imp impacting our personal relations, our social relations of all kind, and our politics. And people are now realizing that our politics is being corrupted by the communications, false, false news, false communications, both home and abroad, over these networks. And what we have to do is what we did, Americans did in the 19th century. We regulated the railroads. We regulated telephones and AT&T for decades because it was so fundamental to our public good. We have to do that. Minimally, we have to regulate it. It's like PG&E. What we're realizing now, PG&E was private. OK, that worked fine for a while. You could say, oh, I'd prefer public. But private worked well enough. But now we see, with the pressure of the wildfires, the crisis that we're facing with climate change, PG &E, the PG&E model is not good enough. So even our governor is talking about taking over PG&E. And even some of our political leaders are starting to talk about maybe we should break up Facebook, or we should take it, parts of it over. But certainly, we have to regulate it. We have to come to terms with the most fundamental technology of our time. Let's talk about one more utility, and that's something that I know you're an expert in, uh, which is water. Uh, California doesn't seem to have enough water. And so Governor Newsom says, well, Jerry Brown said we need two tunnels. I think we can do it, fix everything with one tunnel. Is the tunnel, uh, help me explain, <laughs> help me understand this. Is the tunnel going to fix anything? No. The tunnel is the peripheral canal reborn. I helped write a study that defeated the peripheral canal in 1982 by popular vote. But it's like the zombie, it just won't die. So the peripheral canal was meant to bring water from north to south? Yeah, it's to get Sacramento River water, to build a river around the delta to carry the water down to agribusiness and Southern California. The tunnels do exactly the same thing. It's right off the delta, 
All we care about is getting that water south. Now, to be fair, Los Angeles, Greater Los Angeles, they do a very good job of managing their water. They have about five sources. They do a lot of recycling, a lot of groundwater management, and so on. The problem is agribusiness in the San Joaquin Valley, and particularly Westland's water district, which is always wants more water. They have no good water. They have toxic soil. We should not be growing all those almonds there that we do which, by the way, do not feed the world. They mostly go into perfumes and shampoos and things like that. And, you know, mixed nuts are not feeding the, the poor of the world. So we need to keep an eye on what's happening with water and make a point of understanding it better yeah. is what I'm hearing from you. Yes, absolutely. The problem is there isn't any more water. Okay, these, the dams were great for a certain amount of time. We've built all the good reservoirs in California. We now have even more erratic water supply than ever, which those reservoirs were built to kind of stabilize. But our reservoir capacity is only good for three and a half years, as we found out in the last long drought. So in a drought, you're not going to have any more water. So having a tunnel isn't going to serve any purpose. It's going to go nowhere. It's just a useless uh, project of, that uh, is an imagination of certain growers, somehow it's going to magically produce water, but it isn't going to be there. Okay, a final question about wildfires. Now, you did mention fires, and we haven't talked too much about climate change. We're going to be talking about that a lot more later in the show. But do you believe that people in our area, especially in this region, should be able to build their home in a place where uh, they lost a home to fire, and the insurance says, here's a million dollars, rebuild your home? Should everybody be allowed to do that? Well, this is so tough because emotionally you want to rebuild, you want to restore people's lives, but it actually doesn't make sense. There are certain areas where the fire, you can map this, the fire danger is much more intense and we can't simply allow any longer these individual decisions uh, at, in those areas where it's a clear and present danger. I think Californians and particularly people in Sonoma County understand that wildfires are here to stay. That's not just a passing thing. It's going to get worse. Therefore, we as a society have to take care to regulate and plan our urban development in a much more rational way. Well, thanks, Dick Walker, for joining us this afternoon. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Now, another important feature of our upcoming year is the 2020 census, which will have a profound effect on our politics, and on our social fabric in the decade to come. Here's Dolores Huerta, a founder of the United Farm Workers, talking with us late last year about why everyone must be counted in the upcoming census. Well, it's extremely important, and this is our message to everyone. If you don't get counted, you, your community will lose tens of thousands of dollars or over a period of 10 years. Yeah, because in California, for instance, every person gets will get approximately $2,300 from the government for each one of us that are counted. So over a period of 10 years, that's $23,000 per person. And, uh, and that money will be used for our schools, it'll be used for infrastructure, it'll be used for, for health projects, et cetera. So we have to get counted. And with the uh, communities of color, especially the Latino community, we are very fearful because we know that there's been a very uh, active campaign against the Latino community, all of the racism that has been thrown at them, and it's made people very, very fearful, especially people that are immigrants, people that are undocumented. And in the Central Valley of California, and in the Los Angeles, other places like that, we have huge communities of immigrants, and they are going to be afraid to get counted. And one of the things is that we filed a, a lawsuit with the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund to take the citizenship question um, or to make sure that that question would not be on, on the census questions, and we won. So the, the citizen, citizenship question will not be uh, on, the, on, the, on the census question, but we are so fearful that a lot of people will be afraid. And so we have to convince them, number one, the census is private, and that the information cannot be divulged to another agency or to another person, and if anybody does, they can go to prison for five years or get face a $250,000 fine. So this is the work that we're really right now focusing on between now and April 2020 to organize neighborhoods, organize communities and say, please be counted because we'll lose money 
into our community if we don't get counted and we'll also lose representation in all of our city council, school boards, state legislatures and especially the Congress. The 2020 census will be a game changer in terms of how cities in the Bay Area will be represented moving forward. Although surprisingly, no one I spoke with in San Jose or Oakland mentioned the census as one of their concerns. Instead, affordable housing and development took the spotlight. Google is planning to build a massive new campus in downtown San Jose on property they purchased from the city. Their development plans encompass over 9 million square feet, with offices, greenways, and up to 5,000 new homes. When I interviewed people in San Jose, many had mixed feelings about development in general. So let's hear what they had to say about development and other issues they're concerned about in 2020. How are you feeling about the new year? I'm feeling apprehensive about the new year, given the recent um, killings in Iran. What are your hopes for the Bay Area this year? I hope we can find more affordable housing for people who uh, work blue collar jobs or service jobs as those are the people that I tend to employ and uh, with the rising costs of of housing in the Bay Area, it makes it really tough. There's a lot of flight. People are actually, you know, leaving to the Northwest or other places in the U.S. to try to find more affordable housing. Do you have any thoughts on some of the new tenant protection laws that are coming into effect this year, including making it harder to raise the rents and making it harder to evict tenants? Those are a start, you know, but unfortunately, uh, City Hall, <coughs> excuse me, um, continues to treat developers as if they were the people. And I know they want to raise their tax base and things like that, but they just really need to take a stand. Um, the, the laws are good, and sometimes they get stronger, sometimes they get weakened. As far as tech goes, I'm really excited for the Google campus to be moving into San Jose, and I think that's going to bring a lot of positive change to the area. What kind of change are you hoping it will bring? Um, I'm hoping to see better transportation, um, better, uh, uh, maybe a bigger cultural impact in the area. I think. Uh, San Jose loses, it kind of seems to be the, you know, the little sibling of San Francisco and Oakland, and I think it will help bring about um, maybe a cultural revolution where San Jose becomes more of a hub from things outside of technology, but culture, arts, etc. So I'm actually waiting for like more transportation to um, different cities like LA or like um, even further out. That would be awesome. I think that's really needed for people that commute. Well, thank you so much. Anything else you'd like to add? Um, no, I see a lot of potential in San Jose and the cities nearby. So I know pretty soon we're going to be a big city like L.A. within just like within a decade. So I'm really excited to see that. We're now going to hear from one of the most interesting leaders in the Bay Area. Greg Saris is chairman of the Federated Indians of Great Rancheria. He's also a writer whose latest book is a set of folk tales called How a Mountain Was Made. Saris told me that the tribe's Great and Casino has given almost $120 million to the local community. Much of that was mandated by the agreement to site the casino in Ronard Park, but about $15 million, according to the tribe's math, has gone to environmental and social justice causes. I asked Saris how an understanding of the history of Indian extermination and removal is central to the tribe's current roles in the community. How do you deal with mass genocide where 90 to 95 percent of the indigenous population was wiped out in a short time and you took the land? You can't really wipe that one away except to forget it, to push it away, push it to the sides. And Consequently, there's two stereotypes that remain of the American Indian, the way we continue to be othered in a small way that we are remembered. One is the old stereotype that uh, uh, we're wagon burners when it comes to a power uh, a question of power or territory. That's how they othered us. They were wagon burners, terrible people. Um, and the other now, more recent one, is lo, the poor fallen nature god. Oh, you know, it's terrible what's happened. Um, but we love their art and we love them in museums and all of that sort of thing. It's part of history. Never are we complicated individuals who've endured and in many ways shaped American history. Let me ask then 
for specifically for 2020. Okay. What your main things that you would like to accomplish, what you'll be proudest of when you look back in 2021. What does this coming year look like for you? Very important. Just as we created a partnership, precedent setting partnership with Sonoma County for the co for with a co-management agreement of Tole Lake Regional Park, we are now looking to create partnerships with nonprofits, the state parks, and the federal parks to co-manage and support those parks with those respective agencies. I think partnerships are key and we can create those models. And so I'm really looking forward to creating those partnerships. And in fact, I talked to Gavin Newsom about that just before Christmas and he was thinks that's the way to go. Partnerships are what we have to do. The other thing that I'm also really proud of as I'm on the uh, board of the Museum of, of the American Indian, the Smithsonian Board, and uh, they just agreed to allow me, uh, working with them, to create a template for the public schools to, to recreate the history and culture that will be taught of Indian people in the schools. A template that'll be fourth, for fourth grade, eighth grade, and the senior year. And the template, each template will have, depending on the difficulty of the level, will have three strands. Um, national Indian history, state Indi Indian history, and local Indian history, preferably written by the local Indians themselves. We will create this digitally. It'll be in the libraries and public schools for all teachers in these classes. And where's the funding coming from? The funding, a lot of it's going to come from Grayton. Huh? Okay. The, the other thing that's happening in 2020 are things that we have no control over. There'll be an election, there'll be an impeachment trial, there will be continuing tensions in the Middle East, there'll be a census. All of these things are happening whether we want them to or not, and they will affect us and our lives. What's your thought about any of that in the coming year? Um, I, I'm, I'm very worried, obviously, about the world situation and climate disaster. Um, and I obviously we have to vote in state and federal elections. We have to voice our opinion. We have to protest and do all the things we've always done and pay attention to the larger currents. But most importantly, all of us have to act locally and do what we can and what's within our power locally to create models, healthy cells. So even if things fall apart, there will be a counter narrative. Let Sonoma County, let Grayton Resort and Casino, let the Federated Indians of Grayton Rancheria work with others, the parks, the regional parks, the county, the state, and the federal government to create healthy models that are a counter story to one of homelessness, fear, and environmental degradation. Okay, and then let's go, it's 2020, let's look forward to 2040. Uh, you probably won't be the chairman anymore, you'll be 87, <laughs> so will I. Um, but what do you see in the, in the further future? Because one of the things we're doing is we're looking at 2020 and then our idea was to look at the future with uh, as close as we could to 2020 vision. Uh, yeah, look back 20 years <laughs> and what's happened and look forward yeah. 20 years. Well, um, the... I'm, I'm very concerned about the climate models and how fast we are, and, and that is going to determine everything. And until we come to terms with that, I think if we are around and if civilization isn't, as we know, it isn't greatly compromised, what a world economy hopefully will be based on will be a, an economy of environmental recovery. Because that is what we're gonna have to do and if there's any business and jobs to do to survive, it's going to have to be in that area and involve many of us. So if we are, if we look ahead 20 years and things are happening very fast, um, and there may be some difficulties, but if we get past war, if we get past famine, if we get past drought, um, we still, um, have the opportunity to work together using human imagination to once again create a healthy home. And if the economy is based on that, on environmental recovery, 
I think we can make it. That's going to be the way. But it's, it's going to take that transformation. Let me end with a story that I, has come to mind. Mabel McKay, the great Pomo basket weaver and medicine woman here who was such an influence in my life, um, about 50 years ago, I was driving back from 40 years ago, God, I'm getting <laughs> old, from Stanford University with her, and she was down there talking to the students, and we were driving, and she was looking at the hills, and she said, everything's going to dry. Everything's going to go dry. It's going to burn. The world's going to heat up. Everything's going to go dry. That's before we had terms like global warming, and, or at least they weren't in car, uh, common parlance but at that point. But um, she was saying that, and of course, I was a young, youngish man, and I said, oh, and she said that was her latest dream of the future. And uh, I said, oh, Mabel, what do we do? Well, that's horrible. What are we going to do? And she started laughing. And she said, that's cute. What are we going to do? I said, no, Mabel, I'm serious. Really, what do we do? And she was silent for a moment. And then she said, as clear as a bell, you live the best way you know how. What else? So now, going to the next 20 years, we have to live the best way we know how. We, we can't be scared. We have to find peace within ourselves because the whole notion of running and being scared of the future and the past is something, is a, history, is a history that shaped where we are today, fearful and running, fearful of the other. But we do have to find ways to live the best way we know how and live it. All right. Thanks, Greg. Uh, I always <laughs> love talking with you. I appreciate <laughs> your taking the time. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you for caring. Now, 2020 will be key to the tribe's influence and credibility, as it has promised additional tens of millions of dollars for its social and environmental agenda. Next, the final round of interviews you did on the street. And, and I guess what I want to know is, what were you left with? Are, are people hopeful or are they anxious? Well, people certainly had a mix of emotions about 2020. People certainly expressed a lot of frustration at what's happening at the national level. I think they also expressed a lot of fear that some of their hopes wouldn't actually come to fruition this year. The state has promised a lot in terms of affordable housing, and they really want to see that happen. But let's go ahead and hear from folks in Oakland. What are your resolutions for the Bay Area in 2020? Uh, fewer homeless folks. <laughs> and fewer cars on the road and more affordable education. I'm an educator, so my mind, my heart is always focusing on public education as well. Um, and with the new year comes a lot of new opportunity and with this upcoming year being an election year too, I'm really hoping that that is a focal area that people really prioritize because public education is um, the heart and soul of our youth in so many ways. I would uh, primarily try to work on some of our zero waste efforts. Um, there's a lot of innovation going on in the recycling world that I don't think uh, Bay Area or Californians know much about, particularly looking at plastic film, the greening of roofs, but using that as um, urban gardens um, and using that as a food source that can then help uh, in some of the uh, food desert areas that we have in, in Oakland and the East Bay. More affordable housing also for seniors, for example, because it's the Bay Area is aging. Although we hear a lot about the young people, it's also aging and people are getting just thrown out of their homes because they cannot afford rent. What would you like to see from our local leaders here? Well, if uh, you could spend billions of dollars on wars and and foreign aid and but you can't clean up your streets then maybe you should ask local people who have solutions and what would you like to see for from our local leaders this year um just to step up you know step up on housing step up on homelessness um and you know keep keep the bay area safe uh, that's welcoming to immigrants and affordable and at the same time uplift uh, the local culture that you know that brings us to the bay segment of the hour, we're joined by Sharon Fuller, a lecturer at Sonoma State University, as well as Lucia Garay and Estrella Pacheco, who are youth, youth activists here in the North Bay. 
Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Sharon, we'll start with you. Before teaching at Sonoma State, you founded the Maya Youth Academy in Richmond. And the academy really focuses on empowering youth to take control of both economic and environmental justice issues in their own communities. Can you talk more about your work there? Right. Maya Youth Academy was an organization that partnered with school district to teach students and the community members how to be community monitors. And so they were the agents that went out into the community to reduce exposures to environmental hazards, to educate people of how to reduce their exposures. Wow. And what kind of um, issues did you tackle? Now, it's youth-led, and so the, the students decided that they wanted to focus on fishing communities. And so they designed a healthy fishing initiative where they identified the healthy fishing spots and ways to remove toxins from fish before you cook it to reduce exposure to contaminants in fish. And why do you feel like organizations like these are really crucial in 2020? Well, I think the youth have a lot of information and insights. They're the ones that are out in the environment. They're in those creeks. This youth-led environmental um, fish initiative was something that they went out in the communities with their families. And so they knew the spots that were where communities were, where families were um, fishing. And they also knew how often they fished. And so it was a great segue into identifying different programs where they could actually reduce exposure and not rely on agencies to come in and with solutions. It was a community-led solution. And Estrella and Lucia, you are both very involved in our community. Estrella, let's start with you. What work have you been doing with your high school? Um, so I have actually started a organization at my high school that is, um, we call ourselves Annally Activists, and it started as an Instagram account which has now grown to almost 900 followers. And we basically are working with the students and the school to, um, and our community around the school to just kind of um, provide a voice for youth activists in the area. Wow, and how successful do you feel you've been on campus and how motivated are other students to join in that? Um, we have definitely had uh, an influence on campus. Currently we're working on voter registration and we definitely, we in the climate strike in September, we had a large influence in getting a large amount of Annalee students and West County students out to Santa Rosa. And Luthia, you've worked with the Junior Sonoma County Commission for Human Rights. How do you see that work influence your current activism in terms of climate change and do you see climate justice as a human rights issue? Um, I started out with my activism in the Junior Commission, but before that I had always been active in uh, local environmental movements or uh, stewardship projects. Um, so when I started my work uh, investigating racial harassment in schools, it was easy for me to see the connection between racial justice and uh, environmental justice. Um, I've also always been passionate about the environment. so. I really think those two issues are combined, especially in Sonoma County where we have uh, so many vulnerable communities. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I'm curious about where you see this intersection in Sonoma County and what youth activists have really done to address this. Mm -hmm. um, I think specifically for Sonoma County, we can ignore the fact that um, in all the ways that Sonoma County is experiencing climate change are ways that affect frontline communities um, like immigrants and the Latinx community. So for instance, there have been a lot of um, issues regarding the human rights of immigrant workers or um, workers in our agriculture industries. Um, so for them, climate change affects how they work and how safe they are when they're doing that work. Um, for them, it just affects those communities especially because they don't have as much of a voice as other privileged communities might have. And Sharon, this has been a key topic of your work and when we spoke on earlier you mentioned that this was part of the reason you wanted to become involved and do your research on climate change specifically. Can you talk a little bit more about how you see that happening in the Bay Area? Well, it's a matter of equity. A lot of communities, the black, brown, Asian, and Native American communities are being impacted differently. Um, a lot of the resources that they use in the water bodies is a part of cultural practices. It's not a subsistence. And so they're using these resources on a daily basis. And when we have these ecological events, we have these fires, and we have these floods, they are directly affected by the contaminants and the, the, the fish population abundances 
where that change their ability to continue their cultural practices. And so what I want to emphasize is it's a part of the culture. It's not a part of some recreational or sports activity. And these ecological events change their ability to continue those cultural practices. So it is impacting folks who are relying on these resources in Lake County and Mendocino County, upstream going all the way down into the bay, and looking at how temperature rise, sea level rises, are impacting folks' ability to actually continue to fish in places that is a part of their cultural traditions. And how do we need to expand our framework or the way that we talk about climate change to include people who are directly impacted? And how do you think that that would change some of the solutions that we propose in terms of the climate crisis? How do we need to include? It, that's a very interesting question because those conversations are happening. Now, including folks who are having those conversations is a part of the problem. Um, because the communities that I just mentioned, they have very direct and strategic ways of reducing their exposure to these, these particular issues, and they have ways of addressing it. But they're not always at the table. And so part of the issue is creating a, a genuine collaboration that acknowledges these different narratives, and those narratives are often mission, missing. How are people working and relating to the environment? And it's not just in a capitalist economic model. What does it mean to um, have access to the waterways? What does it mean when you don't have access? Um, and so it's creating the space to hear those voices, and not just after you've already decided what the plans are going to be, but when you want to collaboratively create solutions, everyone needs to be at the table. And Luthia and Australia, how have you incorporated this in, into your work? Australia, let's start with you. When you work with youth at the schools, how do you talk about some of these issues and you know make sure that you have a lot of different ideas and, and thoughts at the table? I think one of the big ways that we always try to look at things is we're always saying, who are we missing? Especially because I'm from West County, which is a very uh, privileged area. A lot of the time we're talking about we don't have a lot of the men in the room. We don't have a lot of people of color in the room. We don't have a lot of these communities that we're talking about that need to be here for us to have a whole picture. And so sometimes when I've seen other organizations, they will kind of trivialize those people. They will bring in a person of color, they will bring in a person of Native American descent, but they will not be there to actually be working with them, but more to say, we are being inclusive. And so it's always a conversation, who are we missing? How can we address this? How can we try to get these voices here? Because really all the solutions, all the work that we're doing needs to be um, inclusive and working with multiple different sides of the story. Luthia, do you have anything to add to that? Um, just that I agree that uh, it's a big issue, especially when it comes to activism, to make sure that you're not trivializing any group of people um, and not tokenizing any person as uh, someone who you can hold up as an example, but not, you're not actually using to include every voice in the conversation. And Sharon, we've been talking a lot about housing and equity on this right. show. Um, and I think for some people, you know, it's hard to imagine what climate change might have to do with housing, but they're really very closely related. Can you talk a little bit more about Oh, climate change has a see? lot to do with housing. And, and Sonoma County, Lake County, Mendocino County are unfortunately excellent examples because of all the devastating fires that we've had in this area. And these fires, these ecological events, and the, the floods um, that we've had in this area are displacing hundreds of people. And often these people are unable to find housing. And a lot of their stories aren't told. We talk a lot about the folks who um, own houses, but what about the renters? What about the ones who are displaced and they're working, but they don't have sufficient funds for the first, second, the first, last, and the deposit for um, another place to rent after they've been displaced by these ecological events. So from um, a disaster point of view, there are a lot of people who are being displaced that are not being really discussed. And so we need to talk about a lot of mothers and their children who are homeless who are working, but they don't have permanent housing anymore. 
And do you see any solutions that you're hopeful about in 2020, or do you see things more or less proceeding along the same lines? I see a lot of solutions. I, I, I love the work that the youth are doing at your, your high schools. Um, and like I said, being open to listening to other ideas. Young folks have already changed the narrative. They have continued to change the narrative. They're, even if you think about sort of the traditional holidays, rather than a huge turkey, they're thinking about, well, maybe we don't need all of that food. So they're changing behaviors. They're changing how we consume. They're looking at ways that we are not emitting so many contaminants into the environment. So it's changing gradually, and land, land use practices will also change. But a lot of these conversations are being initiated by our youth. And Estrella and Lucia, do you have anything else that you'd like to add about the work you're doing in the community? Any messages that you really hope our audience will take away today? Estrella, let's start with you. Um, I think that the biggest thing is, I think this is the decade, this is the years that we kind of need to start changing. It needs to be all the way from the top of the capitals, all the way down to the streets. And it's really time for everybody to do their part, especially the people with the most power. And we only have a little bit of time left, but any concluding thoughts for our audience? Um, I would just say I've been involved in a lot of protests and actions and uh, strikes and things like that, but I really think that in this coming decade, it's time to uh, stop taking action like that and start taking legislative action and, and changing the laws and changing our behaviors instead of just having an event. Well, thank you so much, all of you, again, for joining us on a Sunday night. Um, we really appreciate your time, and I hope you have a good rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that concludes this edition of Connect the Bay, Bay Area 2020. We'll continue to follow these issues throughout the year. Let us know what topics you'd like us to cover or send us news tips at news at norcalpublicmedia.org. We're also on Twitter and Facebook at norcalpublicmedia. And you can also write to us at news at norcalpublicmedia.org and we'll post all of this at our website at the same address. Thanks again for joining us and have a good rest of your evening.